Of interests and has done a lot of great work across many different areas, including physics, uh, mathematics, uh, and computer science. And uh, his his uh, topic areas have ranged all over the place, but they include quantum computation, uh, statistical physics, uh, financial markets, uh, how academics spread, fairness and algorithms, and, and another uh, ten or so things that, that I didn't have time to write down. Uh, he's also the co-author of the uh, textbook The Nature of Computation. And uh, we're very happy to have him here uh, again. He's been a, have done a um, sabbatical at Michigan, I think, uh, a while back. Yeah. Ago, but uh, we're very happy to have him back with us. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for having me. I hope my voice is not too loud. If I get too excited, we can turn it down. Um, I just wanted to recommend this book to you. So it was written in 1953 at a very different moment in history, just after World War II, and the author starts with describing a visit to Nagasaki to see the devastation there, and then he talks about the culture and values of science and what, what science has to offer the larger culture, the larger human culture in terms of its values. And now that we're at another difficult moment in history, I, I think it's worth pointing out that, you know, all of you here have some very strange habits which are very rare in society. You are willing to ask questions. You're willing to admit that you don't already know everything. You're eager to learn more. And as a corollary, you're also a humane person because, and it probably makes you sad that many people in the world don't have the privilege to learn and create the way you do because if they did, then you'd get to learn more from them and that would make you an even better scientist or engineer than you are already. So I, I think that these are really valuable ideals, even though we sometimes fail to uphold them, ideals are important anyway, and I think this is another moment when we should try to remind our fellow human beings that it's good to be open-minded and truthful and intellectually honest and curious and all the other things that seem to be increasingly rare at the moment. So um, carry the flame. All right, so I've had the great privilege of working with a lot of collaborators, uh, some of whom are in this room, and students and postdocs, and if you feel like having a postdoc at the Santa Fe Institute, or a friend of yours would, um, let me know. We also have a yearly summer school, primarily for graduate students, um, across all fields, uh, science, engineering, physics, economics, um, social science, and so on. Okay, so I'm going to tell you about an analogy between statistical inference um, and statistical physics. And I hope that this will be friendly enough so that even if you are familiar with neither of these, that you'll kind of enjoy the analogy. And the overall question is, how can we find patterns in noisy data? So there's some data you have. It has some truth behind it, some pattern behind it, but there's also a lot of noise and randomness which is obscuring that pattern, and you want to try to see through that noise and understand the pattern underneath. So I will show you that there are phase transitions analogous to those in physics, like when water freezes or boils, when its temperature crosses a certain threshold, in these problems um, where if there's too much noise, we suddenly cannot see the pattern at all. Um, then we want to find algorithms which are optimal in the sense that they succeed all the way up to this point. So whenever it's possible to find the pattern, we want an algorithm that will in fact find the pattern. And so since we'll, we'll find in some cases it's hard to find such an algorithm and so there will actually be two different types of barrier uh, to seeing patterns in noisy data. 
one of which will be information theoretic. There literally isn't enough information in the data. It's, the noise has, has obscured the pattern too much so that no matter how much computation time you have, there's no hope of recovering it. But another type of barrier is computational. Namely, we think that there's no polynomial time algorithm, no efficient algorithm, although of course that's very hard to prove. So um, I want to start by illustrating this analogy with a really simple common thing, uh, which is maybe something we do so often we have forgotten why we do it. So um, suppose that I have a bunch of data points and I want to fit a straight line to them. Well, what do we usually do? We say, well, here's our model. You know, it has a, a let's see, which one do I? Ah, <laughs> not that one. Okay, um, one of these might, oh, that looks like a laser. Okay, good. So we have a, a model of, with a slope and an intercept. That's the model we want to fit to our data. Well, what do we do? Typically, we find the least squares fit. We add up all the squared errors from our model to the data and minimize that. Why? Why do we do this? Why in the world is this a good procedure to fit a straight line to a bunch of points? Well, there are a lot of good reasons to do this, but one of them is the following, which is a kind of Bayesian reason. So suppose that my model is that the data is not just this straight line, it's the straight line plus noise. And furthermore, suppose I think that noise is Gaussian, it's normally distributed, so that it has a probability uh, which is exponential in minus its square. And suppose I think that everything is basically independent, so then the product of uh, all these exponentials is the exponential of the sum of the squared errors. And so maximizing the probability means minimizing the sum of the squares. So this is one reason why you might use least squares to fit a straight line to data. If you believe that the noise is Gaussian, that the variance is the same at all the points, and so on. Um, and then if you, if you like Bayes' rule, you would say, well, all else equal, if I kind of have very little opinion about what's going on really, then the probability of my model, which in this case is just given by the slope and the intercept, given the data, is proportional to the probability of the data given the model. And so my maximum likelihood estimate, or the MLE, if you like those three letter abbreviations that people seem to like, um, is my least squares fit. Okay, now um, let's change this up a little bit to illustrate the analogy here. Um, I'm going to, for reasons that may be mysterious to you, define the energy as minus the log of the probability. And uh, so that would give me this sum of squares. And well, if you remember your first year physics, you remember that if I have a spring and I stretch it by a length x, that it has an energy in it, a potential energy, which is quadratic in the amount of stretching, okay? So I can visualize what's going on here as taking a yardstick and attaching it with a bunch of springs to my data points, and I had a high school teacher who actually did this with rubber bands and a bunch of thumbtacks, and it was really nice to see that, yes, the yardstick settles down into that least squares fit. So um, minimizing the energy here, the energy of these springs corresponds to maximizing the probability. And um, physicists call the minimum energy state the ground state, so the ground state is the maximum likelihood estimate. Um, now, certainty here would be saying we're at, like we're at absolute zero, right? It would be like saying, oh, well, I, I'm at, I, the system is, has no thermal noise whatsoever, so it is exactly in its lowest energy ground state. But of course, that's never true, and things are always wiggling around a, lit, a little bit with, uh, you know, random vibrations. And that corresponds to the fact that we should never be certain about our estimates of things. So, um, and by the way, let me just illustrate that our energy here was a function both of our model of the underlying pattern, namely a straight line, and our model of the noise, 
namely our assumption that it was Gaussian, we can change both these things. So for instance, one problem with least squares is that it's very sensitive to outliers. If I have one data point out here, which is rather far from the line, well, this string is stretched pretty tight. And that outlier will tend to skew the, the, the line quite a bit. And well, there's a whole field called robust statistics that tries to deal with this sort of thing. Because after all, maybe this point shouldn't count. You know, maybe that point happened because someone forgot to turn the particle beam on, or because our, our mice in our lab had, the, had a cold that day. And, you know, we should sort of recognize that it's an outlier and, and have it count less. Well, one way to do that is to say, I will change the model so that the noise isn't just a Gaussian. It's a Gaussian, but with a bigger probability than a Gaussian would have of rather large noise, because every once in a while, the rats have the sniffles, and somebody bumped the detector, and so on. Well, if I take the log of that sort of probability, I might get a gooier spring um, with a potential energy which isn't uh, quadratic anymore, but might flatten out when you stretch it a lot. It's like um, chewing gum or something. You know, you stretch it a lot, and it, it starts to uh, pull less on you. Oh. OK. Sorry, I bumped that again. Gooey, chewing gum, gooey springs. OK, good. All right, so my point is that if you have different beliefs about the noise or different beliefs about the pattern, you can put those in uh, either to this physical analogy or to your probabilities. Um, anyway, so again, there's a lot of thermal noise. Things are wriggling around. So um, Bayes says, uh, and by the way, I, I'm a moderate Bayesian, um, a reformed Bayesian. I'm not a fundamentalist Bayesian. Um, it's fun to encounter these religious debates. I tried to make a joke once about Catholics and Protestants, and no one got it at all, so I won't do that again. <laughs> um, anyway, so. Be, uh, Boltzmann says, ah, well, just as you shouldn't focus on a single estimate, things are never at absolute zero. So it's true that rocks fall, things like to be in low energy states, but they're also being jiggled around. And so Boltzmann taught us that the probability of being in a given state is proportional to an exponentially decreasing function of the energy, but this exponential matters less when the temperature is large, when the system is hot. Uh, so that the hotter it is, the more common it is to occasionally see things in high energy states. Um, which is why, inverting this, I defined the energy as minus the log of the probability. Remember when I did that? I was just solving for E there in terms of P. Um, so at low temperature, things are concentrated on ground states, and that's like well, if, if you really believe that there's not very much noise, then you should announce very proudly you found the true slope and intercept. But at high temperature or high levels of skepticism or modesty on your part, you should say, well, I'm not so sure, actually. This is the most likely slope and intercept, but really there's a lot of uncertainty, just as if I took the table with the thumbtacks and the rubber bands and shook it a lot, that the yardstick would jiggle around. Okay, so Bayes and Boltzmann. Um, and so the, the upshot is I have an energy defined by my model and by the data, and then I'm interested in finding this equilibrium distribution this thermal equilibrium, or Boltzmann or Gibbs distribution, which is also, in Bayesian terms, the posterior distribution of the model given the data. OK? Good. All right. Now, let's look at a particular physical system, which is kind of a canonical example of these phase transitions. Uh, people have known, I think there are even some quotes from the ancient Greeks and Chinese, that if you take a, a, an iron magnet and heat it up, its magnetic field gets weaker. But it wasn't until, uh, it wasn't until the Curies came along, that's a picture of a magnet, okay. It wasn't until uh, the Curies came along, in particular Marie's husband was responsible for this one, 
um, that there's a, a critical value of the temperature at which the magnetic field suddenly drops to zero. You might think that as I add more thermal noise, the atoms are less likely to line up with each other and that the magnetic field would kind of gently go down, well, maybe until the whole thing melts or something. But in fact, that's not true. Uh, there's a particular temperature at which it very suddenly loses its ability to maintain a magnetic field. And this is a classic example of a phase transition uh, where as I vary some global parameter, the behavior, the macroscopic behavior of the model changes suddenly. So if we were to look at the atoms here and say, let's for simplicity say that they're either pointed up or down and color the up ones white and the down ones black, then what happens is that below this temperature, there is a clear majority of one or the other. It's not, you know, it might be say 80% are all lined up together. And then there are little islands of the minority. And overall, most of them are lined up together and we get a strong magnetic field. Above this temperature, at a large scale, it looks like white noise. It's still true, maybe you can see that nearby things do want to be the same as each other. So we have lots of little clumps of the same color. But at a large scale, we have an equal number of black and white, up and down, everything cancels out, and we no longer have a magnetic field. But you can think of this really in almost like an, uh, an information theory or a communication theory point of view. Think of this atom, which is, say, pointing down, as trying to send a signal to another atom far away through a chain of interactions with their neighbors. But there's also a lot of noise because the system is hot. So what happens is the, the signal really doesn't get through, and information does not travel large distances, and so there's no global coordination of the magnet. Well, I'm going to talk about a similar thing in data, in analyzing data. So you could have, for instance, two clusters in high dimensional space, and maybe these are clusters with Gaussian noise, they might overlap, and your goal is to label points according to which cluster they belong. And there could well be some temperature-like parameter. There are a couple you could imagine. One is the, the noise, the width of these clusters and how much they overlap. Another could be the ratio between the number of data points and the number of dimensions we're in, for instance. And you can imagine that you could have a similar transition where when there's too much noise, you suddenly lose the ability to label these points better than 50-50 asymptotically. You might as well just be flipping coins. In fact, you might not even be able to tell if there really are clusters. So it might become impossible for you to distinguish a pair of clusters from a single big cluster. If I asked you to tell me which, which of those two models do you think created this data? So that's the idea. All right. So I already kind of said this, the states of the model, the sort of physical states are like the variables that we want to infer from the data, such as the labels of the points in the clustering I just showed you. The physical fields and interactions between them, the energy are given by the data and our model of it, including our model of the noise. Um, this Gibbs or Boltzmann distribution is the posterior distribution. I just said that. The magnetization here would be like the accuracy. So like a very well magnetized system would be one where the points are correctly labeled, almost all of them, except for a small minority. And an unmagnetized one would be you know, total noise where we can't figure anything out. Um, and I said that, and uh, so we want to locate these phase transitions and find algorithms that succeed all the way up to them. So that's the idea. So let's look at a classic problem um, in social networks, and this is a, a very popular problem in network theory. Here is a picture that some of you, I know some of you have seen. Um, this is a network of political blogs from the 2004 presidential election in the United States. Um, and an, a link here means that one blog linked to another. And uh, as you know, human beings, we have these tribal tendencies, we tend to only want to hang out with people just like us, it's one of our major failings. Uh, but so as a result, 
these blogs tend to link just to other blogs with whom they agree. And this produces two very visible clumps. I forget which are the Democrats and which are the Republicans. Um, a guy named Andrew Sullivan, I think, is one of the few who connects to both. Um, anyway, so a favorite pastime in network theory, uh, which in computer science is sometimes called the graph partitioning problem, is I give you just the graph. I hide from you all the eloquent and well-considered arguments and content that were in these blogs. I just give you the topology and then ask you to find the two communities. In this particular graph, this is a really easy problem. Nearly any algorithm will get more than 90% accuracy with very little effort, but we can also imagine situations where the signal is less clear. For instance, if people occasionally connect to people they disagree with, that would confuse things and make the problem more interesting. So um, part of what I want to tell you is that looking for the ground state, the most likely uh, division, the, mo the best fit of our model can be a little misleading. So here I have a graph and I have divided it into two groups, which I've put on left and right and colored red and blue, so that only 11% of the edges cross between the two groups. And the other 89% of the edges are all internal within one group or the other. So you might think, I have done a pretty good job here of finding these two communities. And uh, if I change up the color scheme, it would even be suitable for the cover of Science or Nature. The problem is that here is another equally good division of, these, of this graph into two, uh, two groups. And in fact, there are exponentially many divisions into two groups in this case that are all equally good in the sense of having about 11% of the edges crossing between the two. And this is all just a trick because what this really is is a random three regular graph, a random graph where every vertex has exactly three neighbors, but I wired them up to each other willy-nilly. It just happens to be the case that out of the roughly two to the n ways to divide it into two groups, or n choose n over two, um, there are some that are surprisingly good. So uh, now, so you can imagine a little dialogue, your friend, the sociologist brings you this data and asks you to find the communities. You do so, um, they're very excited, they're about to send off the paper and you say, oh wait, hold on, I found another division. It's actually one edge better than the one I told you before, but uh, it's totally uncorrelated with the one I told you before. So then your friend gets a little annoyed and says, well, which one is right? And well, the answer actually is, is neither. So, what is happening here is something that our friends in statistics have been warning us about for about 100 years, namely overfitting. So what's happening is that we are seeing patterns where they don't exist. Humans are really good at that. Uh, we're very good at finding black cats in dark rooms even when they're not there. A friend of mine teaches uh, probability and he loves to, ch to challenge his students by giving them a long string of zeros and ones and asking them to find the pattern in it. And they find all kinds of patterns. And it was a series of coin flips. So, um, okay. So, uh, but our algorithms can, can fall into the same trap, especially if you're in a community which loves fancy models. And a lot of our friends are in scientific communities that love fancy models with lots and lots of parameters. And so here, for instance, is a sequence of fictional stock prices, and here is an 11th order polynomial which fits the data really well and clearly indicates that you should buy this stock. And <laughs> what, what we often need to do is use a simpler model with fewer parameters which does not fit the data we have perfectly, and when we do that we find it does a better job at fitting the data that we don't have yet that we're trying to predict. So I'm sure many of you are already familiar with this. Um, it has lots of names, but the lesson is you shouldn't always squeeze your data too hard to get a pattern from it. 
because you might be guilty of overfitting. Um, and you're really just fitting the noise and not any underlying thing. All right, so uh, what's the picture here? So going back to this energy landscape, this landscape of possible fits to the data and the energy that each one has, I know that you might think that up is good, so I'm going to flip everything upside down so that we're trying to find maxima instead of minima. Um, so rocks will now fall upward for the next few minutes. So here's the idea. If you could magically see the entire landscape, and if it was dominated by a single peak, so that all reasonably good models were close to one best model, well, then I agree. You have good reason for saying you found a pattern in the data. On the other hand, if the landscape looks like this, then it's more like that red and blue example I showed. There are lots of good-looking local optima, lots of high peaks, but they're far apart from each other. They have nothing to do with each other. Let's say that you could magically find the highest peak. Uh, maybe you find this peak here, and it's three feet higher than any of the others. So you found the optimum. Well, congratulations. That probably took you a lot of work. But I'm not sure that work was worth doing. Because after all, the data is noisy anyway. Maybe we do three more experiments. The whole landscape tilts slightly, and maybe now that peak 1,000 miles away is the one which is three feet higher than any of the others. So what I'm trying to say is that you should not necessarily think of inference as an optimization problem. And indeed, it might be a hard optimization problem. It could be NP-hard in the worst case. But what you really want is to understand this entire landscape and whether or not there's some kind of consensus among all the good states. So anyway, that's one take-home message. You, you, can, you can go home now if you want, but that's, that's one take-home message. OK, good. So we want to understand this whole landscape. We would like to be able to sample from it. Again, in Bayesian terms, we want to understand the entire posterior distribution and not just one estimate, even if that estimate is the most likely. All right. So um, let, it, let us play out these ideas in a particular model of networks which we can use to find communities. This is a popular model. Uh, it goes back to the 1980s. It was originally... Um, invented in the sociology community. It's been reinvented or rediscovered many times, both in computer science and in random graph theory and physics. Um, it's very naive, but then again, so is drawing a straight line through a bunch of points, and we do that all the time. So, you know, let's, let's not be too disappointed with its naivete. So here's the model. There are k different types of nodes or groups or communities. And for me, k might be two or three or seven. Figuring out what k is is a tricky problem, and we can talk about that in the discussion. But I'm going to assume that I know it. And my model, it's what people call a generative model. It's a model which will produce graphs which have community structure. And the model goes like this. It says, well, if uh, I have one vertex which is in group R and another vertex which is in group S. There's a link between them with probability P sub RS, where P is some K by K matrix. Those are the parameters of the model. And um, so my goal is to invert this model, to fit it to a graph. And uh, so rather than generating graphs, I want to take a graph that you've given me and try to figure out which, which, where the communities are, what the best labels are, or, well, the distribution of, posterior distribution of labelings. And I'm going to focus on the very sparse case where these probabilities are order one over n, where n is the number of nodes, so that the total number of neighbors that you have on average in the world is a constant. I'm going to focus on this case because it's, it's the hard case for me. And uh, because if you have a whole lot of neighbors, then that gives you a lot of information about you, which is why, for instance, Facebook knows everything about you. But imagine that I only knew your actual friends, of which you don't have that many. 
okay? So consider, imagine that we're looking at the actual social network and not one of the online ones, um, I, then that's relatively sparse. And so here the idea is that even if I know everything about your friends, if you only have three or four of them, I would still be fairly uncertain about you. So this is where, the, where this problem gets interesting for me. Um, and a popular special case, just to keep things simple and symmetric, is that there's one thing on the diagonal, the probability of connecting with others of your own group, and another one, typically smaller, off the diagonal. And again, we mostly like hanging out with people like ourselves. We would call this assortative or homophilic, or physically we would call it ferromagnetic because iron atoms like to line up with each other. Okay, good. Now, let's do that trick again where we change from probability to energy. So here is the probability of the graph given these labels. This isn't so hard. I, I basically told you what to do. Each edge exists with this probability, P sub this node's type comma that node's type. So the probability of the graph given the labels is just the product over all the edges that are there of the probability they are times the probability of all those that aren't of the probability that they aren't. Okay, um, good. But of course what we want to do is invert this and get the probability of the labels given the graph. And that's quite tricky. So again, using this, uh, this analogy where let's imagine that the probability of the labels is proportional to this thing that Boltzmann taught us where it's exponential in the energy, we set the energy to minus the logarithm of the probability and we get this. Okay, all he did was change the products into sums. All right, I, that's true, that's all I did. But the nice thing is this form is very recognizable to physicists there's this thing called the Ising model of magnetism, which is actually what I showed you before when I pretended I was showing you something about magnets. I was showing you something about the Ising model of magnets. And it has a term in its energy for each pair of, of atoms that are adjacent or connected by uh, a, a bond. And it says that the energy of that pair depends on whether they're in the same group or not. And so, that term looks very familiar to a physicist. There's also this kind of weaker interaction between the things that aren't connected. And, well, why is that? Well, um, you know, if, if Chris and I are in very different communities, then that's a little bit of evidence that we're not friends. If the graph is sparse so that most pairs of people are not friends anyway, it's rather weak evidence. But it, it, does, it, do, it tells us something. We can't totally neglect it. Um, and so these interactions encourage things to be the same group as their neighbors. These interactions basically keep us from putting everyone in one huge group, okay? They push us more towards dividing the network into several equal groups. All right, so now we have this energy function, we can ask, well, what physics happens now? If we study this as a physical system, does it have phase transitions and so on? All right. So there are lots of ways to study this kind of thing and many tools that have been built up over the years in statistical physics, um, many of which are what theorists would call heuristics because they're not mathematically rigorous. A few of them are mathematically rigorous and there's lots of things in between. Um, here's my favorite way to study these things. So this, I'm going to show you belief propagation, which some of you already know. Um, belief propagation is a cool way to do inference in what people call graphical models. Here's the idea. I have a bunch of variables, which in this case are the nodes of my network, and they are going to send messages to each other. And the idea is that each node sends to each of its neighbors a message telling it the probability, its current estimate of the probability that it belongs to a given group, say. So this is the probability that I tells J that I is in group S. And um, there's an interesting twist to belief propagation. 
which is that when I talks to J, it bases its message on I's other neighbors, K, and not what J tells it. And when I talks to this neighbor, it bases that on these other neighbors. So this is a kind of curious thing to do. Why would we do that? Well, there are a couple good explanations. One is this sophisticated explanation about variational methods, but the the hand wavy explanation is this avoids a silly echo chamber where, you know, I say to you, let's see, could I possibly think of an example? Uh, I'm not sure if this ever happens in human society. Oh, well, okay, suppose I tell you, ah, my candidate is the best candidate for president, and I think lots of people think that. And you say back to me, yes, yes, lots of people think, including me, that that candidate is really good. And I say, ah, good, I've just heard from another person who thinks that candidate is really good, and I tell you that. And you say, oh, I just heard from another person. That Okay, so yeah, I, I always debate which example to give, you know, two people on a talk show saying global warming is a hoax, uh, you know, someone saying that the new restaurant is really good. Anyway, the point is it would be silly to meaninglessly amplify information just bouncing back and forth between two people. We need to bring fresh information into the conversation from elsewhere in the network. You thought this was a computer science talk. It's actually an amateur uh, politics talk. Okay. <laughs> So the idea is we pass these messages around until we reach some kind of fixed point. This might take a long time. It might never settle down. And it might settle down to a fixed point which is really wrong. But if we're lucky, it settles down to a fixed point where these probabilities are pretty accurate, where they're good estimates of the marginal probabilities, the, the probabilities in the post, a posteriori given the data that we do belong to different groups. Um, because it's still fairly early in the afternoon, I will actually show you the equation. Um, don't worry about it too much, but I did want to show it to you. Um, again, here's what I says to J about the probability it's in group S. This is just normalization. If you want some overall probability being in group S, you can stick it there. Um, here's, here's where the real action happens. So we take the product over all those other neighbors, not the one we're talking to, and for each one we take the sum over what group they could be in, and, we, and inside the sum we take the probability that they're telling us they're in that group and multiply it by the probability that there would be an edge between us if they were and if we were in this group. And this is just Bayes' rule, right? So if there's a certain probability that we would be connected if, if, you were in, if you were red and I was green, and we are connected, then Bayes' rule says I should multiply the probability that you're red and I'm green by that. Um, this is this interaction between the non-neighboring things, which I'm going to ignore, but there's a big deal here, which you may know, I took a product over all these neighbors. So I, in essence, assumed that they're independent of each other, or equivalently, I assumed that my different neighbors interact only through me, that they're not directly interacting with each other. And of course, this is just plain false in many networks, because, for instance, in most real networks, there's plenty of triangles. But, well, maybe, maybe it's not too bad. So this actually only works on trees, but on graphs with loops, sometimes it isn't too bad. We might even be able to prove in certain families of random graphs that asymptotically it gives good results. All right, so what happens when we try this? Well, here's what happens. So what did, I, what did we do here? We cooked up a graph which was actually generated by this stochastic block model. So it has communities. But there's a ratio here. This is the ratio between how often you connect to people outside your group to inside your group. At one, this is what people call an erdos renyi random graph. You're equally likely to connect to everyone, which means there aren't actually communities at all. Okay? Uh, at zero, you only connect to those in your own group. So as you might imagine, as this ratio increases, the community structure gets weaker and harder to find. 
But look at this curve, it's kind of reminiscent of the magnetization in that magnet in the Ising model, where when I pass a critical temperature, which here is more like a noise level, uh, the randomness in your connections, suddenly you go from being able to identify, say, 90% of the nodes correctly to zero, which here means no better than random chance, no better than flipping coins. And again, as with the magnet, you might have thought, oh, my ability to label the points will tend continuously to zero, but indeed it crashes down to zero at a certain point before then. Um, so what is going on? So um, in a physics paper, we conjectured that not only does this algorithm fail in this regime, but every algorithm fails, which is pretty gutsy. Um, well, let's first talk about why this algorithm fails and why it fails at a particular threshold which, which we can compute. Well, if you recall the equation I showed you a moment ago, there is a silly fixed point that belief propagation can fall into, at least if everything is symmetric. Namely, suppose all your friends tell you that they are equally likely to be red, blue, or green. Well, you do the math and then you send out messages to all of them saying that you also are equally likely to be red, blue, or green. That is a fixed point of the equations. The question is, is it stable or unstable? So if our algorithm falls into that silly fixed point, we don't know anything about anybody, and we might as well just be flipping coins. Hopefully if it's unstable, actually even a small perturbation away from that will fly away, hopefully in the direction of the truth. Okay, so that's the basic question, and this is the point you do a little analysis, a little calculus, and this is the point at which it becomes unstable. So, um, right, so we conjectured this in a physics journal, and by the way, I really recommend the following career strategy. If you can actually prove something, send it to a math journal or a theoretical computer science conference, and if you can't, send it to a physics journal. The important thing is you get to publish it either way. Okay, so I, I really recommend this. Um, and, and the great thing about physics is we don't mind getting things wrong. We're not even bit embarrassed. We're a little bit embarrassed. But you know, it's, it's, it's much better to say something wrong than to say nothing at all in physics. Okay, so don't do that whole pure mathematics paralysis where you're unwilling to say anything because you can't prove it. That's a terrible, that's a terrible culture. Anyway, a couple of years after we made this conjecture, it was proved by some extremely clever people. Um, and they proved that in this regime, it is information theoretically impossible, asymptotically, to label the points better than chance. So again, this has nothing to do with computation, P versus NP, any of that. There's simply not enough information in the random graph. And um, they proved that the uh, posterior distribution is asymptotically uniform. But you know, if you pick most pairs of points, they're totally uncorrelated. So again, even if you have enough computation to do perfect Bayesian inference and figure out the true posterior probability of all possible labelings, you just can't get it right. You can't even tell whether there are those communities whether the graph was generated by this model or this one here where you're equally likely to be connected to everybody. Okay, so that was very nice. Yes? Yeah, I'm sorry. C is the, C is the total average degree, the total average number of neighbors. Right, so I mean, intuitively as the graph gets denser, the problem gets easier. Okay, so um, uh, I, no matter how many slides you take out of your talk, you still run out of time. So I'm trying really hard to avoid that. Um, I'm going to skip most of this, except to say that if you work out a little transition matrix that tells you all else equal, if I'm in one group and you and I are neighbors, what's the probability that you're in another group? It becomes a little transition matrix, what some people would call a Markov uh, random field. And um, there's a kind of, there's an, an eigenvalue uh, which tells us, in essence, the probability that the effect of a link is to copy my group to yours. Okay, so 
It's like if there were nothing else in the world besides the two of us and the link between us, with probability lambda, whatever my group is, you would be in the same group. And with probability one minus lambda, we would be in independently random groups uh, as if the link were not there. And so this is a nice overall measure of the strength of the community structure. Um, so with that, we can define this little diagram. And most of the following things have now been proved. Not all of them. And if you're a theorist and you want something to do, then we can talk about which things are still open. Um, in this regime, there we can label the points better than chance, and we can do it quickly. And there are several algorithms, a spectral algorithm based on something called the non-backtracking matrix, the belief propagation thing I showed you, several algorithms work. So in this regime, the problem is, is easy. And in this regime, it's impossible because of that information theory issue. Okay. But this is the picture for two equal groups. All right, you might think, ah, two groups, three groups, who cares, what's the difference? But in fact, some additional phenomena show up when we have more groups. So here is another example. Oh, yes, this is a picture of rabbits. Uh, OK, I, I'm just going to tell you this because it's really sweet. There is an ancestral rabbit who is either black or white. Rabbits, as you know, reproduce asexually. And, <laughs> and at each generation, Fibonacci taught us that. At, at, each, at each generation, each rabbit has C children. And the rule is uh, each child is, it, it inherits its parents' color with probability lambda, the same lambda I told you before, like my group is the same as your group because we're neighbors. With probability one minus lambda, it may or may not be the same color as its, as its parent, but it's a random coin flip. Now, I do this many generations, and I show you just the descendants. I hide from you everything above, and I ask you, as a good Bayesian, to infer the color of the ancestral rabbit. And the question is, for what value of lambda and c can you do this better than chance? And if lambda is too small or c is too small, then you, even if you can do full Bayesian uh, inference, the color of the ancestral rabbit is exponentially close to uniform, so you really don't learn anything. And it turns out the criterion is this C lambda squared is one, and that's the same thing that I showed you here, where C times lambda squared is, is one. Okay. So um, that's a, if you haven't encountered that reconstruction problem, it's a lovely exercise in probability with a lot of subtlety, especially if there are more groups. And um, Okay, good. So here's another experiment. Here I have five groups. And again, I run a belief propagation. This is the average degree of the graph. Um, up here, I zoom up to a highly accurate fixed point. Down here, I always zoom down to zero, and I totally fail. In between, there's an interesting region. If I start at most initial conditions, I arrive at this silly uniform fixed point and fail. But if I cheat and start very close to the truth, which I know because I'm running the experiment, then I find that there's another fixed point which is quite accurate. OK? So here I have two fixed points, the unaccurate one and the accurate one. They're both locally stable to small perturbations. But unfortunately for us, and by the way, the following is not a theorem, and I would love to make it a theorem, so let me know if you have time. Um, all but an exponentially small fraction of initial conditions fall into the useless fixed point. Okay? It is this regime where we think the problem is information theoretically possible. If you could do this exponentially many times until you got lucky enough to start close to the good fixed point, or if you had time to do exhaustive search, you would find it. So the information is present in the data, but we think it's computationally hard because we think, we think most of the time you will fail to find that, uh, the good fixed point, and you'll fall into the bad one. And this is also a kind of familiar phenomenon in physics. So where you don't have any windows in here, 
But you may know that window glass is made of silicon dioxide, it's melted sand, and silicon dioxide would really like to be in a perfect crystalline state. Its, its ground state is a perfect crystal. So if it could find that ground state, it, it would be very happy, but it never does. Because what happens is as you cool it down to make your windows, it gets stuck in this much more jumbled amorphous state and it will stay stuck there until the stars burn out. So it never reaches equilibrium and it never finds the lowest energy state because it has this energy barrier between it. We would have to rearrange this and that would conflict with that and we would have to rearrange a lot of other things and the energy would have to get a lot bigger before we got over that hump and we never will. And this is a similar situation to what I showed you. The idea is that if I start close to the ground state, I will find it. If I start close to the truth, I will find something pretty good. But I would have to do, I would have to be exponentially lucky to start in this region of the space. In almost all of the space, I'll get stuck in this jumbled state. Okay. And again, there are things here that I would like to see proved. So we're in the non-rigorous zone here. Um, so there's a lot of good work to do. Um, all right, so there are more questions you can ask. Okay, what if I give you a nudge toward the truth? I'm going to, oh, okay, sorry. Here's this diagram. Let me just say this. We again have an easy zone. We again have an impossible zone, but we, and we know roughly where the thresholds are. We now have this area where we think it's, we, we know it's possible, but we think it's hard. Some people call this a statistical computational gap. Um, so you may have encountered that phrase in uh, some other contexts. All right, so then we can play lots of games. What if I tell you for free a certain fraction of the labels to kind of nudge you toward the truth? Well, we can do those calculations, at least in the synthetic model. And there's this nice curve of discontinuities where for some parameters, your ability to label the nodes will jump discontinuously if I give you a little bit more information for free. And this is, um, it's a little bit like an epidemic, right? So if I tell you Chris's label, you know his label, and you can make good guesses about his neighbors, decent guesses about their neighbors, but maybe it sort of dies out, like a little outbreak of a disease. But if I, tell you enough people, then it will percolate and become an epidemic of knowledge. And then we'll really get an, uh, an accuracy close to one. And that kind of percolation process is what causes this discontinuity. Um, I will show you one more pretty picture because it's so, I'm going to skip this. Here's, this is so pretty, I can't skip it. Um, so here what we did was we took that blog network and we divided it into those two big groups, which is really easy. But then we tried to subdividing those and subdividing and sub subdividing. And we stopped when a kind of physics based calculation said there's no more to do. You've, you know, there's no more structure here. Now, I suppose it could be that these are the labor Democrats and those are the environmental Democrats and these are the anti abortion Republicans and those are the capitalists and I'm not sure. But because, again, unfortunately, we've lost all the excellent content of these blogs, but um, maybe it was some subgroups like that. Okay. Uh, good. So to finish up, uh, what's the idea here? Lots of problems involving high dimensional data, data where you have a lot of data, but you also have a lot of variables. And let me pause here to notice that we talk about big data, but we also often have big models. And in many cases, what matters is not how much data you have, it's the ratio between the amount of data you have and the number of variables you're trying to fit. It's the number of variables, the amount of data per variable. And in that sense, big data is often not that big. For instance, in a social network context, we could have a huge social network with seven billion people. But again, if each person only has a few friends, I only know a little bit of information per node, per person. This type of situation is generally called high dimensional statistics and it's where these phase, these phase transitions live. So lots of problems have these phase transitions. 
These include things that have nothing to do with networks. I love networks, they're very cool. But these also show up if I have a, a tensor with some underlying structure, like it's a low rank tensor, but there's also a lot of noise. In compressed sensing, there are thresholds in how many samples I need before I can reconstruct a good image. Um, I already talked about high dimensional clustering where we have points, say 10,000 points in 7,000 dimensions. We have you know, transitions there as well. So um, these ideas from physics can help us locate these transitions and in some, case, in some cases can inspire some new algorithms. Um, a lot of this work can be made mathematically rigorous and some of it hasn't been, which for me as having one foot in each community, I really enjoy. Um, and also, I, I, want, I want to say one thing about the culture of machine learning. So if you go to machine learning conferences and, and read machine learning papers, I don't want to offend anyone here, but I sometimes feel that the structure is, ah, well, our algorithm uh, got 87% on our favorite benchmark, and last year's algorithm only got 83%. End of paper, we win. And the reason our algorithm did better, well, we're not sure, but we used a, an eight-cylinder engine instead of six and a Phillips head screwdriver instead of a flathead. And we, we walked around it three times counterclockwise and then kicked it and used a new brand of motor oil. Okay, so I, great, congratulations, but you've given me very little information about your algorithm. You've given me essentially one bit of information. It did better than last year's, great. What are its strengths and weaknesses? Which, which examples does it find difficult? On what, on what kind of examples does it fail? You know, your job is not yet done. We should start rejecting all those papers. <laughs> so the other, the other thing is that if your algorithm is different than last year's in six different ways, I have no idea which one contributed to its success. And um, I like studying really simple algorithms that I can actually analyze and understand something uh, either analytical in the physics sense or rigorous in the mathematical sense about their abilities and when they work and when they don't. And that's because um, people like Einstein have taught us that we should do things that are as simple as possible instead of with the kitchen sink. So um, thank you very much for listening and I guess we have a few minutes for questions. Thank God. Oh, okay, yeah. It's very interesting when you're looking at physics and energy and looking at applying to information theory. Do you view, um, in the way you're doing that, uh, energy being information? Uh, well, so, f for, I mean, first of all, I, this analogy is not original with me. I mean, if people in machine learning talk about Gibbs sampling and so on, so it's, it's, a, it's a classical thing. I think when you, if you go back and if you look at thermodynamics, a lot of it is just information theory. In fact, one lecture I, I saw said it's a little tricky to figure out what part of thermodynamics isn't just information theory and which part is sort of actual physics. Um, so there are, I mean, I don't know if this is helpful, but like, the, the Boltzmann distribution minimizes the, something called the free energy. And, um, and so it's, uh, it's a lower bound on the free energy of any, of any probability distribution. Well, all you have to do is sort of change your terminology. And this statement is identical to, this, to what people do in variational inference, where they say, well, the actual distribution, the posterior is really complicated, it's this exponentially large object. I'm going to focus on a simple family of probability distributions with only a polynomial number of parameters. And within that family, I'm going to, in physics terms, minimize the free energy. That turns out to be exactly the same as minimizing the, the kullback leibler divergence between that distribution and the true, uh, the true posterior. So a lot of the tools in these two fields are really identical. And um, 
and I think you know lots of the practitioners on you know know that, but uh, these are probably analogies we should play up more. I mean, I, I think the goal here is to say, well, everybody, even if everyone understands that analogy, now there's all these cool phenomena in physics from the study of glassy materials and things that have trouble reaching their ground states and the whole phenomena of phase transitions. Let's see how much of that we can import into uh, problems in inference and networks, whatever. So, um, yeah. It's fun to be an import-export agent. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, in fact, um, before before our work, so my my uh, uh, um, people like Mark Mazard and Andrea Montanari have a whole book called Information, Computation, and something. And one of their chief examples is error correcting codes, like low density parity check codes. And there they argue that there's exactly the kind of energy barrier I showed you, where if you're doing some local algorithm uh, to try to fix the parity checks and get closer to the true code word, you can get stuck in this useless state for a long time um, and although if you could, if you had the luxury of exhaustive search, you would see, uh, you would get much closer to the code word. So they describe these transitions there, and um, so yes, the, these things can happen in 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 trying to decode various error correcting codes as well. And they also happen in spectral algorithms, and you know, Mark also is an expert on this, where if you're doing something like PCA, and you're, so you're, you, know, you have some covariance matrix, and you think that its dominant eigenvector is informative of some underlying pattern. Um, well, again, if it's high dimensional and there's noise, that dominant eigenvector may or may not be correlated with the ground truth. And there's a transition in that which you can derive from random matrix theory. So that's also a nice example. Ah, okay. Yeah, well, uh, this is a model selection problem. And, and again, the, the, the danger here is overfitting, right? So in this particular model, imagine that I put everyone in their own group of size one, and then I just said, oh, well, if you are connected, I will say the probability of you being connected is one, and if you're not, it's zero. Perfect fit to the data, right? But this is equivalent to taking all my data points and using a curve with so many parameters that I could fit any points. So some people would say, I've, I've I have uh, memorized the data, but I've learned nothing about it. And in particular, I would be totally helpless to generalize to, da to, generalize to data that I don't have yet. So if you don't tell me whether or not there's a link between two nodes, I would have no ability to predict that. So there are lots of different philosophies about how to choose the number of groups. One is to use some kind of minimum description length. So uh, I, I, I think this is okay. I have mixed feelings, but um, if I'm trying to describe the network or compress it, well, if I put everyone in their own group, I haven't compressed it at all. I've just, I've just basically said the entire adjacency matrix of the graph back to you. So on the other hand, if I compress it too much so that my model is inaccurate, I would have to give you a lot of additional information to say, oops, actually that pair is connected, uh, even though the model doesn't predict that or something like that. So you can look, you can ask for the minimum description length. You know, another thing I might say is, why are you doing this in the first place? So this is a theory talk, um, but if you have a real network, well, no real network is generated by this model anyway. So maybe the question is, what is your application? If your goal is to, for instance, predict links, then you should figure out how many groups 
uh, you know, for, for what number of groups you get the best accuracy predicting links. Um, so I guess for me, when you're really, de when you're really dealing with uh, real data, I think it's appropriate to be application dependent, you know, to ask, well, what, what, why are we fitting this model to this data anyway? Um, those are two of the many <laughs> uh, ways to do model selection we could talk about, but there are, there are more. Please, uh, please join us on the third floor for the reception, and uh, let's thank uh, Chris. So, do you think it was at the right level for this?